um, you know, but I have been diving into my um, bookstore haul uh, that I reported on a couple of episodes ago. And um, I started, I just, um, I'm not ready to issue my report, <coughs> but I just started um, reading a, a book called Kirby and Lee. Bragadoom Kaplow. That is hot. I can't wait to get I, I can't wait there. to get my inks on that one. Damn, make that all uh-huh. make that all rattling and shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're we're uh we're showing here this is uh gonna be page one or I think page one of issue two. That's right. Uh, and yep. I noticed there's there's still some details. I I uh I had like a lower level of finishing at the beginning, and so I do need to go back and uh, and flush out some of these like details, make them a little more clearer. But um, yeah, we were just uh, reviewing page one. <coughs> Excuse me, right. page two, page three, page four. Uh, this is when we get into this big action sequence. Uh, we're, we're back from the flashback and uh, the chase scene. Page five, uh, page six. This is uh, where we've been for the last couple of weeks. And uh, in the middle of this fight scene, page seven is uh, where they're uh, trying to take out the motorcycle riders little by little. Um, and this is where we were last week. They threw the Molotov cocktail into the uh, cab of the ice cream truck. Molotov, what's that? It's a firebomb. <laughs> Take cover. And um, then, oh, this is this is before a little out of sequence here. This is page seven. So this was right before that. Yeah. Lots of fighting. Yeah. And this is page eight. Um, and uh, the firebomb is let off. So now we're on page nine, and this is where we're gonna land for today. Um, and I, you know, it's funny how many, how often I have to refer back to the previous pages for little details that most people probably don't even notice or care about. But but I'm obsessing over, you know. Oh, what how, what what exactly was the angle of that, uh, you know, vent? What what was the uh, position of the uh, steering wheel, you know, all that kind of stuff. Great uh, so, topic um, for our episode today. Obsessiveness. <laughs> Sorry to jump in there, but keep, right, well, keep going with your thinking because uh, uh, you kind of pinged, a, pinged something for me too. So go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's just for me. Um, you know, it's same thing with my other comic. Like my other comic, I'm doing with my students. It really doesn't matter, <clears throat> but I do try to keep continuity. Like if you draw a demon on one page differently than another page, nobody's really going to care. But, uh, you know, I am I do take pains to make it look like, oh, this demon has three horns. This demon only has two horns. So um, for uh, for this, I'm just trying to get, you know, just trying to get it right. And, you know, I don't know, maybe subliminally. Um, you know, the continuity, um, matters, you know, from one page to the next, all the details matter. Um, you know, if somebody's really engrossed in the story, um, uh, maybe they don't consciously pay attention to the little things, but maybe subconsciously they do. Um, this is where, uh, the firebomb goes off. The, the flames, uh, start to, uh, well, the smoke and the flames start to envelop the cab and, uh, Turbo has decided what she's going to do to stamp out the flames. Uh, she's going to smother it with this uh, Joker that she pulls off the roof. The guy that uh, threw the firebomb in the first place. I don't like this finger. I'm going to redo this finger. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what the uh, what the verbatim wording is going to be. She's going to uh, trophy's going to say smother it with something. The robot's going to say fire must not reach radio efficient battery assembly deploying flame retardant. Um, 
And then Turbo is going to say something like, uh, got just the thing to stamp out the fire. Um, I don't know why I erased that, but uh, yeah, something like that. And this is the panel that I'm working on now, um, where she is uh, smothering the fire with the guy's body. And he is uh, being used like a rag doll here. Um, where are you at, Kurt? I'm on page 17, which is her trophy girl's escape plan has been executed. So while uh, Turbo is um, dealing with the Fighting laser them, yeah. whip um, and the previous page is having... Uh, you know, uh, busted through the crowds and, and the uh, the baddies um, in the arena, um, which was uh, being taken over by the baddies. Besieged. Yeah, the besieged. Right. Um, but she's uh, found herself, you know, going down a back alley. She's found herself a little uh, covering here. Um, and she's making her way. But, you know, uh, she's going to she's gonna be... Being uh, molested, Ill-advised. yeah, you know, molested by the uh, the creeps that are just uh, you know hanging around in our post apocalyptic um, uh, world. Hey, just right. uh, um, I was working on uh, something uh, editing wise, and um, have you seen um, Cherry Two Thousand yet with Melody? Yeah, you did? did. What did What did you think? I really wanted to know what you thought about that. Um, it was it was pretty good for the fact that it was low budget and campy and didn't try to be too much else. Um, and uh, you know, I thought that it, it you know as always it probably should have had more action and less standing around and talking. Um, but you know, it was in, it was interesting. Like if anybody wants a chuckle, uh, go see Cherry Two Thousand. Uh, you know, it's another one of these post-apocalyptic landscapes um, where there's like some semblance of society in some areas and then some like lawless areas. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess th- this is like a spate of movies that were made after Road Warrior came out in 1980, 80, 81. Um, and, um, you know, try to horn in on the vibe. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, technically speaking, it's a god-awful movie. Um, but, you know, for those of us that are masochistic and like low-budget can't-be movies, it, you know, it, it rang a couple of bells. Um, I, I noticed that Melanie Griffith um, was not her aesthetic best um, in terms of makeup, in terms of costumes, in terms of camera angles, lighting. Um, you know, she just kind of like mailing it in and this is when she was at the height of her earning power. So, uh, you know, I guess, uh, you know, she was maybe already on the outs in, in mainstream Hollywood for some of these better picture roles. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's my first blush at it. Did you like the story? Did you like the story? The whole like robot, um, surrogate lover. You know, mate, and then it breaks, and he had such an exclusive model that uh, there was no repairing her, so he was going to have to go and get, um, you know, just go and buy a new one. But he was like, screw that, and that's where he hires uh, Melanie Griffith's character to help him go into the danger zone and then, um, you know, get the right pieces or parts or, you know, program whatever it is to uh, bring his lover back. Yeah, that was it. Uh huh. Yeah, that, it was it was an interesting hook. Um, you know, they start out with this kind of like romantic scene with this really hot chick named Cherry, and uh, you know, and and she's like this perfectly attentive wife for this guy. You know, she's waiting for him with with a sandwich when he gets home. She doesn't eat anything herself, and then she just starts to make mad passionate love to the guy. And then you know, and then like just within like two minutes, she, you know. She, she short circuits and it turns out she's a robot. Um, and then the guy's like, you know, the guy's like lost without her and he wants to get her re- um, repaired. And uh, the only way to do it is, uh, you know, you can go find some 
like junk parts or something, or you can go find like somebody that knew how to uh, get that, you know, the, the beating heart, the, you know, whatever they call it, the parts. And uh, that takes him into this post-apocalyptic zone, like no, no man zone where she, where he meets uh, this uh, mercenary um, Melanie Griffith. And, uh, you know, very predictably, he, you know, he falls in love with her by the end, <laughs> all of the, uh, fight scenes that they've been through, you know, test their relationship. And uh, it's like the end of 16 Candles. Oh, it was you. I was loved all the time, right? From her. <laughs> right, right. Um, and I didn't need Cherry 2000. But, um, you know, it, it was an interesting juxtaposition. Like, you know, uh, I mean, the the model from Cherry, Cherry 2000, uh, the girl that played the robot was much more young and vivacious than Melanie Griffith. So, uh, you know, I guess for your, for your average schlub at home that's watching, you'd probably be like, no, go, go, no, you know, get, get that part. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, uh, you're better off but, dead. You know, love... <laughs> right. I mean, so, so if there was trying to be a moral or like, or like a conscience, uh, you know, in the story, there it is, like, you know, why don't you take me? I'm human, you yeah. know. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it was interesting. Thank you for the recommendation. It was worth taking down, yeah. and yeah. I had never heard of that yeah. movie before. Yeah, yeah. personal favorite of mine. Um, um, yeah. For its camp, you know, uh, um, and, and just having seen it, you know, when I was like uh, 14, 15 years old. Um, but, yeah, it, wouldn't it also be an interesting um, – uh, remake for nowadays? Oh, well, now you're, now you're getting into, um, you know, the, uh, the idea of, of sex robots, yep. which are, which are here, uh, in Readily real life. Available. Um, there are, uh, you know, there are some better than others, you know, <laughs> ranging from your, uh, garden variety blow up doll <laughs> with like a, you know, like a mouth that looks like a, a you know a bottle uh, like the when when you're recycling bottles, um, but uh, you know there are these there are these sex robots. There you know I I I hesitate to say robots, but there are these. So, yeah, there there's a couple of brands of dolls, and they're uh, you know I guess they're for like real loners. I don't know why they don't give them to people in prison, you know, you it. but uh, you know I think they're. They're uh, they're they're pretty expensive. I have no idea how much they cost, but um, you know, society is going to have to grapple with this. And you know, we do have um, you know, politically, you know, some unrest. And there's this community called Incels, mm -hmm. which is like uh, it stands for involuntarily celibate. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it gets into a lot of these kind of like um, right wing and white supremacist uh, overlap groups, um, but sometimes not. And, um, you know, it's like uh, boys or young men who have no prospect of getting a girlfriend, um, either for their, uh, you know, beliefs or their remoteness or some combination of um, socialization and societal, um, you know, and, and, you know, some of this, some of these guys also call themselves chauvinists. Um, you know, you got the proud boys who call themselves proud chauvinists. And, um, you know, that means if you're not going to get a subservient girlfriend slash wife, then you're never going to have anybody. And so then they just resign themselves to being incel. Honestly, I'm not sure how it all works. And in terms of real life, I'm probably not even qualified to talk about it. I don't know enough about it. But um, when it comes to sci-fi, um, you know, this has been, you know, something that uh, sci-fi creators have grappled with for a long time is a future where robots replace, um, you know, com human companionship, um, uh, you know, male or female. We've seen uh, some uh, sci-fi uh, stories from Greedo Kripal yes. how are, uh, that, uh, that have dealt with male uh, robots that uh, satisfy needs, let's say. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the other the other way is probably more common because um, comic book readers tend to be male, um, more likely. Um, so, 
Yeah, so I've had a storyline uh, for for just as long as I've had uh, Turbo Pit Fighter, um, and I titled it, um, you know, tentatively titled it uh, Turmoil on the Planet of the Sex Robots. Um, I have a lot of roughs and I have a lot of notes, and uh, it could very easily be another science fiction offering, um, and uh, and it it delves into a world where um you know there's been a few there's been a breakdown in society kind of you know kind of just exaggerates you know where we are and then accelerates it and uh men and women no longer cohabitate and women have formed an army uh and men uh, have formed an army and uh there's there's been a civil war between the sexes in this uh in this storyline um any artists out there that want to take it on, let me know. I'll get to it at some point before I die. If uh, after, you know, after we really flesh out Turbo and we really publish, um, but you know, it's uh, it's really interesting. Like you know, I I am going to introduce like all these different models. It's many many years ahead of us now in the future, and um, you know, they are legitimate robots that could be programmed to do a number of things. You know, and. Uh, you know the, the the way that they're really going to impact society in the storyline is that they really replace the um, the need for men and women to come together and uh, anymore, and it, and of course that has a profound impact on fertility, right? And we get into that, and there's like there's there's fertility centers, and actually men become sought after by women for that reason, and they 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 want to extract. Um, you know, seed, and uh, you know that'll that'll be kind of like a a nasty thing. But you know, I uh, I haven't gotten like super super deep into it. Although I did lay out um you know dozens of pages of uh, breakdowns. So that would be um where's my notebook? That would look like this, and it it isn't thumbnails. It's full page breakdown. Oh, okay. So just like in yeah, your so spiral, so, in your spiral. Yeah, I have a notebook, and um, maybe I'll break it out next next edition sure. uh, because this is really fun stuff for me to talk about. Kurt is like future endeavors and future plans yes, and yeah. future uh, storyline. <laughs> um, you know, may, maybe we're just fantasizing about the day where we have this comic company off the ground and we have lots of creators working with us and we can hire people and all that kind of stuff. But for now, there's you just know, you and me. Just me. Just just you. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> we'll see what we can do. We we can only bite off one project at a time. But we love sci-fi and we love post-apocalyptic, and so that will be a, yet another offering uh, for one day. For the, it's for the bucket list for now, but we'll see. And then uh, you know, if you want to talk at some other point about <clears throat> kill crazy priests in, in space, that'll be, that that'll be a, a third offering, which I also have grand uh plans for but uh they're they're not really so they're not really broken down yet on paper um you know i just have like synopses write-ups on that um which i'll have to go over and familiarize myself but that's another great storyline too where uh you know basically like um uh a, a space colony of earth many 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 you know uh ye light years away um, when space travel is perfected and, uh, and we're sending people to other outposts because earth isn't doing so hot, um, environmentally, um, and they're like mining colonies. So I guess it's a little similar to, um, what's, uh, um, what was that Arnold Schwarzenegger? Not total recall, long, but, uh, yes, yeah, total recall. I guess you could say it's a little, um, akin to total recall. But I saw the Total uh, Recall uh, remake, and I don't think they set situated it on a mining planet per se. Yeah, with Colin Farrell. Yeah, I haven't seen that one yet. Right, right. Yeah, that one was that one was a little different. Actually, my kid was take my kid had to see it for uh, a college class, and um, I hadn't seen the original Arnold Schwarzenegger one for years, ever since the, you know first release. But uh, you know, there's been plenty of sci-fi movies about mining planets right oh yeah um that's such in the uh, was... um pulp lexicon you know with all the that was that was colonization back in the 
you know, turn of the 20th century where you, you were going into these other cultures to abstract their minerals. And so you were bringing, um, you know, right. Or gang. just, or just plant yeah, planets that have some kind of so uh, metal or some kind of metal or other elements that you could mine, right? Yeah. Maybe we're going to need Energy. them all for our yeah. smart cars and our robots and stuff. But uh, yeah, there was that, was that, was it Tom Cruise? Wait, what was the one where there was a, a big, like crescent shaped space station that the rich people all go to. And then down on the planet, there was like all worker Matt, bees Matt and. Uh, it was the same. Guy. Oh, Matt, Matt it, it was the same uh, writer director who did uh, District 9. Yeah, that Ooh, was uh, yeah, that was a District one. Nine was really good, and I remember uh, a buddy, you know, also really enjoying that. And he was like, "Hey, man, he's made this new movie, and let's go see it in the theater." Right. And I couldn't get out of there. Yeah, that's so. Enough. It was so bad. It had it had some name like Arcadia yeah. or whatever, whatever yeah. the name of the yeah. whatever the name of the place yeah. was. It was like aspirational. Some people have you know only look up look up in the sky and see it. So, you know, it had an interesting message or an interesting hook you know the meaning of it like you know it was well, basically was a, like a, metaphor a for health him. machine like a hospital bed type of thing that could analyze you and then yeah. and then heal you you know all in one yep. but it was only being held by um the the filthy rich, rich. up on their you know revolving station yeah um, you know hovering, hovering uh, but that that that, that... Yeah, that, so uh, you know, there's been there's been a bunch of different movies, and we we talk about sci-fi here all the time. Yeah. Um, I have a, I do have a a report uh, to uh, in our in our uh, pop culture segment. Yeah. Um, la- just last night, uh, me and the wife sat down and we watched the first two episodes of Sandman by Neil Gaiman, and uh, my reaction is. Um, well, do you want to go first? No, you, you go. Please, I, please, I hear please, some... please, 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 please. Okay, because I heard you <laughs> expelled some air there. Um, first of all, were you a fan of the comic, of the printed comic? Um, by force. Okay. So yeah, I because... was in college at the time, and um, I was a uh, a goth kid. Um, okay. And of course, when I got to college, I found other goth kids. And of course, the first thing out of everybody's mouth was Neil Gaiman Sandman. And I was like, oh, shit, really? I gotta get a hold of this, you know. Um, got a hold of it. And, you know, you're, you're doing your thing, you know, as, as friends do, hanging out so and you're... everything. And they would just goosh over it. And I'd be like, hmm. Peer pressure. Now, right. at the same would... time, at the same time, uh, we're entering James O'Barr's The Crow, and that had me by the balls, and still does. Really? Yeah, it still does. I mean, because because the goth part of it is, um, you know, a lot of the lyrical, you know, for Joy Division and Bauhaus, and, uh-huh. you know, just all that, you know, and their, you know, neo-romantic, you know, oh, love lost and nihilism and existentialism and all that. Fun hoo ha. Um, I I just you know I never had the guts to say what I'm about to say right now is um, <laughs> it, it's it's lame. It's just <laughs> it's you know like you know when you you know when you're in high school and someone would come up and be like yo I, I was listening to the new you know pop band you and everybody would like lame you know it was just right. it just it, it didn't do anything for me i never i could never find a connecting point um to anything i think neil gaiman's a great guy i think he's a very uh creative person um i think he does things right it's just his voice does not speak to me directly and i and mm-hmm. i i can't do anything about it. But somebody like James O'Barr, the way um, he went ahead and, uh, you know, took this gothic angst, he had, you know. Right. He had, he had a dark, noir sensibility, but he had he had more of a story and more of a character. Well, he lost his uh, I mean, fiance in a car accident, and that drove him. He had already started something with uh, – um, 
the uh, what do you call it the 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 the, the crow, um, but then mm-hmm. just you know being a goth individual himself just completely threw himself down it and and then you know uh, tunneled his way through it to come out on the other side with I think something that's a equal to um, Watchmen and um, Dark Knight and as a matter of fact I'm looking at it right now neck in between those two titles. Um, so Wait, Jay, you're James O'Brien's about James The Crow, O'Brien yeah, the collection of The Crow, which is signed by him because my buddy and I drove up to Northampton, Massachusetts uh, for a signing um, at the Word and Picture Museum, you know, owned by uh, Kevin Eastman. I think Peter Laird, too. You hear this, folks? Wow, that's and, uh Yeah, the, yep, yep. And um, when we finally got to Delaware. him, it was like three hours. Both my buddy and I uh, were uh, smokers. So we had had we we were in the building for like half that time. So an hour and a half, you didn't have a a, a cigarette. <laughs> and uh, we got we got deep. to him, and my buddy made a joke about like you're worth the you know you were you were definitely worth the trip you know. And he's like, oh, where did you guys come from? We're like Wilmington, Delaware. And he's like, where the hell is that from? And we're like south of Philadelphia. He's like, you guys drove all the way up here for me. And then I said something to the extent of like. Uh, I'm like, yeah, and I, you know, I said, unfortunately, you know, I'm dying for a cigarette. And he's like, light up, you know, <laughs> and Eastman was behind him. He was like, no, no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, you guys drove all the way up here. And then he lights up. He smoked cools. And uh, that nah, was just great. It was, it was, it was fanboy, Smoking fanboy, indoors. fanboy heaven. Uh, to have that little bit of uh, connection with him. And then we actually ended up talking to him once um, after the movie blew up and he had his big uh, merch thing. Um, we were at Jacob Javits and uh, he was a little uh, disappoint- yeah, disappointed my, uh... in uh, the, you know, people not wanting as much uh, of that merch. Yeah, well, that's what that's my <clears throat> uh, James. Ob- my James Obar story is uh it's really a friend of mine. Um, uh, Mel Yagen uh, was a um, an artist that I used to work with from Queens, and um, he was actually uh, I think I think he was interning for Joe Casada for a little oh. while. Um, um, yeah, he had some connection with Joe Casada for a while, but he was coming back from um, a big West Coast uh, con. I think I think Seattle, if I remember right. And who was he sitting right next to on the plane back but James O'Barr. And this was right when The Crow was huge in movies and was doing blockbuster millions of dollars worth of business. And James O'Barr, um, as I remember, um, took a payout and had a one-time uh, you know, kill fee style payout. Um, for his whole property and all the stories and all the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the Hollywood optioning and um, felt like he undersold. And so, you know, the story was that um, my buddy Mel, you know, I, and of course, this is just, you know, second, third hand, but, you know, that the guy was was depressed to the point of suicidal was was the way it was described because he only got a hundred grand uh and um and you know they were making millions at the height of the uh you know popularity of the crow one and of course that started starred brandon lee son of bruce lee um it it, you know and it it wasn't just a patronage thing it was a hit it was a bona fide box office smash and that led to the sequel in which people may or may not know brandon lee was accidentally killed by a uh malfunctioning um blank uh gun that was fired and uh it uh it shot some kind of projectile into his stomach that uh killed him even though they're not supposed to be dangerous on set uh that's how he died and um the the crow too i think ended up coming out with a little bit of trickery or you know I, right they, did they finish that and they put it there out? was uh like a scene and a half that was not completed with him in it, but they were distant shots. Him running over the um, uh, uh, rooftops is, um, I think, somebody else, and right. there might have been some mapping right. there. 
and then there was something where they ended up just shadowing the character instead of having him come right. in and say something. I think if that's what I remember, but yeah, very, yeah, this very was, sad. This was way, very, it was like a Heath Ledger. It was like Heath Ledger. Cause he, that role cat just catapulted him as an artist. Um, yeah, it was it was it a was, cool movie. Had had oh, some he had just hit kung his, fu his was a, the legacy <laughs> guy and everything. Um, you know, and uh, you know nowadays they would they would probably just recreate you know the scenes in CGI. Uh, we've all seen you know Princess Leia from Beyond the Grave. We've all seen young Arnold Schwarzenegger. We've seen young uh, Will Smith. And CGI can can do anything now, but well, we were uh, talking about days, that a to... couple episodes ago about like animation, and why not and why not just lend voices and um, you know um, appearance because there's just so much out there about these you know folks. Yeah, they can synthesize voices. They can they can use all kinds of existing footage and uh, you know. And they can alter it digitally. I think a lot of them do. But, um, a lot of uh, actors out there really are in love with the craft. You know, they really want to um, get in front of people, you know, via camera and, uh, you know, be challenged. And then that challenge as a success would be you're like, whoa, check out the, the role so-and-so played, you know. So, yeah, and... Um... <clears throat> You know, so so the crow was big, but yeah, just to finish up about the Sandman. Yeah, so, um, sure. I never, I never, I never read the comics. So I was coming into the uh, to the um, Netflix uh, series series completely blank, you know, blank slate. Um, hopeful that I was gonna like it, um, and I, I, I we watched two episodes and we bailed. I don't think I'm going back. Um, it's uh, it's really confusing. Um, and I think it's supposed to be like mysterious, like, and, you know, and purposely vague, but, you know, there's this world where there's like kings of dreams and kings of death and kings of destiny and all these things. And it seems like he's just making up these rules and, uh, you know, there's characters like Cain and Abel that were, who were supposed to be from the Bible, but I don't know how they fit in and. You know, there's all these like fantasy lands and there's dragons and stuff. And um, I just, we, you know, there's no characters that I cared about. You know, the the young Alex who was like, you know, who killed the, the crow and, uh, you know, and, and is helping his father, the Magus, imprison the Sandman or, or uh, Morpheus, you know, for, for decades and stuff. Um, I, you know, you don't care about him. And then, you know, Morpheus is just in there and, uh, you, you know, you don't care about him, but he is this kind of like smoldering goth, like Edward Scissorhands type of a character. So, you know, they did, they did cast well in the lead role. I just, um, you know, you get to the second uh, episode and he's, he's free and he's back in his world and now he's struggling to rebuild his world. And it's just like, I just don't know why, why I should care. Um, you know, I needed some, I think I needed some like characters that I could connect with. And I know this was like a vast world and I know it was popular, like, you know, and, you know, it was a really top selling comic and won all the awards and everything, but I just don't see anything for me. I didn't like it. You (laughs) know who did the comic book, actually drew the comic book? Sam Keith. Oh, okay. But before he of, uh... did um, uh, the Max, so like really came in, and rumor has it like the um, uh, powers to be at uh, DC Vertigo, or they didn't care for him. They didn't think he was. And to be honest with you, too, the same reason I was like, this is horrendous. The way it was. Well, he's credited. Sam Sam Key. He's he's prominently credited in the movie. So yeah, I he's guess, the originator you know, of all of that imagery. Um, and right, but right. I also have to say this: this is when um, the coloring of comic books was getting over, you know, into it uh, and up the hill of digital like colorizing, I believe. Uh-huh. And uh, no, excuse me, I think I'm I, I just didn't like the color. Color was just too bright. Vertigo. Too yeah. bright. So too bright, yeah. 
so yeah that was so it's a that's gonna be a no for me dog and uh you know um you know i i at least i uh you know at least i tried and uh i did i wasn't into it so uh that's my review of sandman if you're a sandman fan i'm sorry uh maybe you have a different uh, way of looking at it uh feel free to comment and you know and take me to school on what i what i'm missing <laughs> but um no no and um you know and and i was kind of relieved because it's like a, a whole other series that i you know don't have to watch now um you know, because uh, it takes a lot of time to watch these things. And if you're really not into it, then, you know, save your time and do something else with your time. So uh, that that's my uh, pop culture update. I don't think I saw any other movies or TV shows um, uh, about uh, sci-fi or superheroes or fantasy. But, um, you know, but I had been diving into my um, bookstore haul. Uh, that I reported on a couple episodes ago, and um, I started. I just I'm I'm not ready to issue my report, <clears throat> but I just started um, reading a a book called Kirby and Lee, uh, which which is going to be amazing, and uh, it is written by somebody named I think uh, Jack Morrow. I know the last name is Morrow, and yeah, he was tomorrow. Yeah, Tomorrow's Publishing mm-hmm. Company. Yeah, so he so he was involved, and he said he he even had to testify in the lawsuit between the Kirby Estate and Marvel. Yeah. Um. Uh, although the way he describes it, you know, everything worked out in the end. Uh, the Kirby Estate got credit and money, and um, you know, and uh, Marvel uh, continues like you know the goodwill between the estate, you know, and um. And you know, continuing to uh, capitalize on the characters. I should say Disney, but uh, you know, we say Marvel. And um, it was contentious for a couple of years there. I think there was major lawsuits um, around 2008, right around the time that Disney, right after the, uh, the in the year or two after Disney acquired Marvel, uh, they still had these outstanding outstanding lawsuits with the Kirby estate and probably some other uh, creators, right, uh, at that point. But, um, you know, it's it's a big, um, it was a big sore point while Kirby was alive that caused uh, Kirby to leave Marvel and to have a falling out. Um, you know, the, I, and remember, like, I'm only, like, one page into the introduction of this book, but that's how juicy it is so far. Um, you know, how, uh, you know, Jack felt that Stan was taking a lot of credit for having created these, you know, masterworks. And, you know, the reality was that uh, Jack was doing most of everything, you know, the, the storytelling, the breakdowns, the ca- introducing characters, um, and, you know, and Stan Lee, according to Morrow, was credited for just kind of reining things in when they got to be too, um, you know, indulgent and, you know, too, too far afield. Um, you know, uh, the, the writer uh, did do all the dialogue in the end. So that was something that Jack didn't have to worry about, um, you know, was finalizing all the dialogue. Um, and, uh, you know, it was kind of Lucy Goose, you know. I think Jack Kirby used to just turn in these basically finished pages that, that just had to be, you know, inked, colored, and lettered, and then put out. And, um, you know, by the time people got them, you know, they would just uh, stand in, in the early going stand without all the dialogue, you know, and then uh, all of the, like, narration and comments, right? And then, you know, uh, it would, they, you know, they would just, go together forward, you know, planning out these series and connecting them to each other and guest appearances. But, you know, a lot of it was just kind of like, um, you know, a day at the office for Jack Kirby. And Well, it's work for hire. I yeah. think the thing that just doesn't ever end up being in conversation when people discuss this is, you know, in law, online on channels, um, because they most definitely did not live underneath those contracts was you were being hired to create you were being hired to create but but there was some but there was some some things that were not specified either way in terms of legal language and you know in terms of the original art and in terms of you know ongoing credit for 
characters that you did the visual design for, or maybe you, you know, came up with the entire thing. Maybe you even invented the name, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, then it, you know, because the, the memories got so foggy, right. We're, t we're talking about 1961 is when, you know, Marvel first came out with fantastic four, number one. So, you know, things got to be really uh, foggy and, you know, people would fight over things. Sometimes you have notes, sometimes you have evidence, you know, sometimes you have contemporaneous witness accounts and all of this stuff came into play um, later on when they were fighting it out. And, um, you know, well, I, shout I was... out to uh, cartoonist Kayfabe because they did take all of that uh, public um, I don't know, the, the, the transcript. The transcripts yes. from the that and uh I, I i listened to them there it was uh it was very enlightening um you know to obviously an error that that we don't live maybe i don't know i'm not really interested in working for a publisher on that kind of kind of work um you know, yeah but work for work for hire well nothing. well yeah, no, it, hire. It, it, it happens all the time there right now you can go on uh there's this interesting Facebook groups uh, called Connecting Comic Book Writers with Artists. And they're looking, you know, the, there's writers or publishers looking to give a page rate to artists, you know, and artists are trying to get, you know, a, a livable wage, like, you know, maybe $100 a page for pencils. You know, sometimes they... Yeah, but that's not, that's not the same thing as, I have this idea, can you figure it out for me visually? Right, they're all looking for Jack Kirby. You know... Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's like the, from the Stan Lee point of view. Like Stan most definitely had a lot of good ideas, a lot of bad ideas too, as well as Kirby did. It was, it was a work for hire situation in order to get product to the printer to get on the newsstands to Stan, sell. Stan was half the of three hundred thousand copies of something to be able to pay your mortgage and put your kids through school. Yeah, well, there were there was a lot of great you know comic books. Like you could look at the Charlton comics. You could look at all these Hell comics yeah. that were not like commercially successful. So Stan was the ultimate promoter, right? He he was yeah. the he was the a writer. He was an editor, but he was like you know the cheerleader, the promoter. He would go out and do press, and he would you know he would also seize on on trends, and he would you know, be involved in hiring and firing and, you know, luring like hot artists to Marvel rather than DC, you know, and, um, you know, a lot of it is business and, and it was a full-time job for God's sake. You know, yeah. he en ended up having to turn over a lot of his writing and editing chores to Roy Thomas and then Archie Goodwin and all Mark Wolfman and all these other people. Um, but, Jim um, Shooter. Yeah, and everything fell into place. Like, if you want to think of it like Thomas Edison, Thomas Edison is credited with inventing the light bulb and the phonograph and, you know, all of these, you know, great inventions, you know, record player. I mean, um, you know, just so many different things. And he didn't actually do the hands-on nuts and bolts work. You know, that was, there was a guy, Nikola Tesla, that did a lot of this stuff and didn't get credited. But, you know, it turns out that, you know, uh, Edison was indispensable because part of the part of the selling job isn't just, you know, going to like industry and going to expositions and going to politicians and saying, hey, we have this great new invention that can change people's lives. It's also getting it adopted as a standard, right? The idea of getting like, you know, 12 volt AC in every household you know, as opposed to some other system, you know, was instrumental. Once they did that, you know, every inventor can now use 12 volt AC in their invention, right? And they could have all kinds of electrical products and components and appliances, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, Thomas Edison did, did all that work, you know, get, you know, it's, and maybe a little bit was luck, maybe a little bit was politics maybe some of it was corrupt you know maybe uh he, they were stealing the thunder of the inventors that really you know scientifically came up with this stuff but you know that's what it took you know to get where we are and uh you know maybe things could have been better if they if they picked up a, a, a different system you know that that hadn't didn't have such a strong promoter behind it but uh you know this is the system that we did have so you know, I mean, it's better than you know, living in the dark with cold water, but, uh, 
you know, here we are. And so, you know, the advance of Marvel Comics was, you know, so many things that fell into place. And, um, you know, one of the things that we really revere here is the, uh, you know, the talent and the efforts of Jack Kirby, who was not only prolific, but he was not only like a genius, but also very prolific, you know, and uh, he cranked out stories that we still, you know, analyze to this day, which is going to be a, a plug for our next segment where we look at Commandy number five uh, and the uh, the work of Jack Kirby right around 1971. Um, and we're, we're going to dive into, you know, these comics that he made month by month, um, along with another, you know, with a workload of other things he was doing at the same time. Yeah. And a good segue, Jake, cause it was right on the 45 minute mark where we're keeping these episodes bite size. Um, and we are making our own comic book. If you don't know already, and you made it this far. Uh, Turbo Pit Fighter, we meet right. every Sunday, and uh, we get pages worked on, um, we keep up to date with each other, uh, keep each other going, um, which we believe is something that's uh, very important in the creative arts, so um, we thank you immensely if you've made it this far, and we call you a Turbo Knot, and, uh, but for the most part... Um, an early Turbo Knot. Yeah, an early adopter. Um, I'm going to say this uh, out loud that I have printed a T-shirt of the last updated logo that I have constructed. Um, probably going to start promoting that. Um, but by this time the video comes out, it'll probably be already out there. So we've got our first level of merch. Um, but as Jake and I have discussed, um, this is not the final version of the uh, uh, logo. logo. It yeah. will be considered a classic. Um, yeah. And when we do have the official logo, this T-shirt and any other merch that's associated with it will be turned off. Um, yeah. So uh, be on the out on the lookout. I'll probably even make a little commercial or something, um, you know, uh, showing it off. Um, and then of course where to go um, to get a hold of it. But other than that, man, yeah, we're gonna um, hit another Jack Kirby Commandy um, breakout video, which will go live. Wednesday, I've been releasing on Wednesday after this Sunday that we're recording, which is the 11th, 9-11th, um, 2022. Yes. This, um, is, uh, so, this, is, this is the book that we're going to be covering in our other episode. You can find it online. Just uh, yes. pop, it in, pop it into uh, YouTube. What, what are our search terms going to be? It's going to be um, the, the makers of Turbo Pit Fighter um, go over the commandy issue by issue. Well, the, the, the title? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I put it in the description that we reviewed it on this day, um, but mm -hmm. I just do Commandy, Last Boy on Earth issued. Um, it's it's funny you say that because I do have a comment uh, that was made, which was very good and specific, but I will bring it up in the episode because it's it is going to help um, uh, create that uh, uh, um, uh, meta tagging. Right, business, right. So. Yeah, we just want but, people uh, to be able to find us. That's all. If they if they're yeah. looking, you know, let's I get some I, good I, traction. We're up to twenty two people now, right now, <laughs> subscribed. So, and I feel great about that. By the way, I'm not even laughing. I'm like for like, I'm like that's pretty awesome. That's just twenty two people that I think authentically like what we're doing. So, Again. thank you, thank you for being a subscriber. Thank you, thank you, watchers. Yeah, and um. I have, uh, you know, I'm, I've just met some new, you know, we started school um, about three days ago and um, we, uh, I, I have some new colleagues that are uh, into art and uh, we're going to, I'm going to share it with them. So, uh, awesome. yeah, some new, uh, some new colleagues and, uh, you know, we're, we're back in school teaching full time now. So summer is officially over, but uh, you know, this, is, this is going to continue to go on once a week and uh, just you know, tune in and you can see from page seven to page eight to page nine, we're going to go all the way. And uh, this is ultimately yes. a graphic novel that's going to be about 180 or so pages, something like that. Yep. All right. With that being said, Jake, I will see you next week, but even sooner in the commandy number five issue uh, thrip, uh, flip through. Um, so looking forward. All right, man. Peace.